I, I haven't got as far with this as I would have liked, uh, just because of time pressures and so on. Uh, and also because I tried to look at DSG models from my, my point of view of being somebody who does modelling in complex systems. And in that sense, it turned out to be even worse than I expected it to be. So uh, I've only got part of the way through pulling it apart, but I'll, I'll do more. If I get this course next year, I'll get it in more, more detail. So last week we went, went through completing the ISLM model and why the neoclassicals wanted to get rid of it. And this week what I'll talk about is the idea of micro-founded macroeconomics. Now, if you look at where the whole, what really drove the development of macro theory for the last 40 years, it's had nothing to do with the macroeconomy. It's had everything to do with making the theory internally consistent. And that means looking, making macroeconomics like an extended version of microeconomics. And here's Lucas in 2003. And this is when they thought that solved everything. Of course, at this stage, economy is booming, passed through the crisis into the, the, the stock market crash in 2001 without much impact. Uh, they thought they'd all gone quite successfully. So they wanted to get rid of Iceland because, first of all, they saw it as Keynesian. Now, they didn't know that it was actually a Walrasian general equilibrium model. Okay. If you read Hicks and look at it, really, Hicks wrote the model before he read Keynes. So it's not a Keynesian model. Uh, and they wanted to go straight from micro to macro, which and the idea was to start with the idea of consumers who maximise utility, but rather than when you look at a standard model of a market, it's maximising utility given your current income levels and current prices for current consumption. For this to work, I want to have maximising utility over time. Okay, So the orientation went from multiple commodities, which was the orientation of computable general equilibrium models back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and they still exist. They're still used to some extent, but not from our people make forecasting because these ones have taken over. So those models had a model and many different commodities, input, output, dynamics, etc., etc. These don't have that at all. To talk about maximising utility over time, they're talking about a trade-off between income and leisure. That's the idea. So you're trying to maximise your overall utility from the combination of, of leisure, where the, leisure where that's a good and income where that's a good, but to have leisure, you, to have income, you've got to, got to work, which is a bad. So they see a negative utility from work, a positive one from consumption, and that's what they're trying to maximise over time. Then you have producers who are also trying to maximise profits over time. And they're both, of course, subject to diminishing marginal utility, diminishing marginal productivity, so all those assumptions turn up as well. And they're trying to force the market to be in equilibrium through time at all times. The real business cycle people believe that's the actual case. So they talk about the Great Depression being an equilibrium reaction by workers to reduce the number of hours worked. Okay. Um, and the, the DSG people say it's too extreme. You've got to say there's some reason why the economy did not return to equilibrium rapidly. Okay. But they still basically have the idea that, that without these shocks, without the frictions, the economy would be in equilibrium. So, now, they don't actually know all the things that I've covered in this course so far. So they don't know that marginal cost is constant or falling for the vast majority of firms. That contradicts their theory of diminishing marginal productivity. It means you can't even get to first base about marginal cost setting price. Um, so that, that's one thing they don't know. They don't realise that consumers can't optimise because they haven't considered the curse of dimensionality that turned up so well in Sipple's experiment with his students to see whether they could actually maximise utility according to the laws of revealed preference for the mere eight commodities. Um, so you can't use indifference curves to describe a single consumer's preferences, let alone an entire economy. But even if you could use that to describe a single one, then we face the aggregation laws that, again, another classic own goal. Um, with this, this is what has started to squeeze us today, or really annoying, huh? I'll try to remain still. Um, so the, 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 the idea we, we find from the Sonnish and Mantel to Birth theorem that you can't aggregate. If you start with consumers who which have different preferences, you can describe using indifference curves to obey the law, laws of so-called law, um, axioms of revealed preference. When you aggregate, because you haven't got any concept of income distribution in that model of consumer behaviour, when you aggregate, you cause substitution and income effects you can't cancel out. So therefore, if you do it with consumers with different uh, tastes and commodities which are luxuries and necessities, then you get any polynomial shape whatsoever you can get for a demand curve. So the whole idea of it being a 
a downward sloping demand curve, that disappears as well. And they get around that by the fallacy of the representative agent. But the whole idea of the representative agent is somebody who is consuming a single commodity. When you look at it, a single commodity, there's no income distribution because one person is a worker capitalist, and there's no, uh, no relative prices because all commodities are the same. The whole idea of, 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 of parallel angles curves for different consumers. And then even if that was okay, the next level is constructionism. Is it possible to build a higher level of analysis, like for example biology, from a lower level, like for example biochemistry? If it was, that would be the typical biochemistry exam. Please take these chemicals and create life. You know, so the biochemists aren't so insane that they can do that, but that's what neoclassicals are doing here. And this is Anderson, the Nobel, physics Nobel Prize, when they're making the comment that reductionism, yes, reductionism has taught us a lot, but reductionism doesn't apply constructionism. It doesn't mean you can go, you can go, you can take a big problem and break it down to the elements to understand it. It doesn't mean you can start from those elements and construct the higher level. And it's because of complexity. Um, you can't do it, and this is a classic body max area. I'm glad he wrote these actual words. I might actually be quibbling about the quote, but it actually says, you can't do simple aggregation, extrapolation. But fundamentally, that's what the neoclassical model is doing, extrapolating from a single consumer and a single firm, existing under the conditions they assume apply in the real world, which don't, to build the model of the, of the entire economy. So given this is their, their ambition, they had to either do it from scratch or hope there's something in the literature. And they did find Ramsey's paper from 1928. Now, who have I victimised with that one? Okay. <laughs> How are you going with it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've the, uh, I'll, I'll give you a different angle, I think, on, on what I take. I think you should be yeah. trying to understand it in this particular paper. Let's we'll talk a lot of about Ramsey's model here, because Ramsey's the basis of everything. Okay? Uh, the, the real business cycle model people took Ramsey's ideas, which were really about effectively a central planner, uh, deciding what the optimum path of consumption and investment had to be over time to reach a point he called a point of bliss. Okay? Uh, to the saying, we all do that because we're all central planners, aren't we? I mean, we can all rationally anticipate the future. Um, so Ramsey's model had the idea of what's the optimal level of savings for a society over time. And that was, they, they, they said, that's perfect, we can build on that, and that's what they use for their macroeconomics. Now, Ramsey was doing it for looking at growth issues. And this is the important where you made your point about Roma is important, because Roma was trying to elaborate growth theory as well. So if you look at Ramsey, he says his objective was how much of its income should, should a nation save? Now, think about that statement to begin with. Uh, how would a Keynesian phrase that statement? How much of a country's income should a nation invest? Okay. Now, what's going on straight away here is the belief that what you save is invested. Okay. So you're living in a sales law type of world where if you don't consume, you therefore cause demand in the future for investment goods. Here, if you don't consume, you're investing. And so you're looking for an optimal rate of capital accumulation, assuming the savings causes the accumulation. And he made a number of simplifying assumptions. Now, <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, committee goes on forever without changing in its capacity for enjoyment or aversion to labour. In other words, we can use the idea of um, utility, enjoying utility from leisure and earning income from labour, but not wanting to work, therefore you have negative utility from labour. Uh, that you can, enjoyments and sacrifices can be calculated independently and added, so there's no problem with some, summing, not just summing utility at a point in time, but summing utility through time, and not just for one individual, but all individuals. Okay, so, okay. and then this classic, we ignore all distributional considerations assuming that the way in which consumption and labour are distributed depends solely on the total amount, so the total satisfaction is a function of the total amount. So, I mean, in other words, no class conflict. There are no capitalists, no workers. Everybody here is Bill Gates and, uh, and a coolie labourer all at once. Now, what these assumptions mean is that you can use a single utility function. Now, you can't criticise Ramsey for making that assumption because he did it before the first paper that revealed this problem, which was Gorman's paper in 1953. 
And Gorman's conclusion was there that you can you can extrapolate from the individual consumer to the market level if and only if. In other words, it's not just a it's it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient but necessary. Personal angle curves are parallel straight lines, notice the next word, for different individuals at the same prices. And what does that mean? It means if you took money from you and gave it to him, exactly the same things would be bought. Now, I know if you gave it to him, what would you be buying? Baked beans. Baked beans. Okay. Would you have bought baked beans? Yeah. Sorry, you did. Okay. We assume you would have bought baked beans. Um, so you're assuming income distribution changes, don't all, the consumption patterns. But in fact, one fundamental thing about the starting point of the whole thing is that if you change income, you change what people consume. Now, suddenly that's being thrown out the window. So if you've done any micro work about, uh, use, uh, about uh, using Engels curves to describe goods which are luxuries and goods which are necessities, and curving, therefore, as income rises, here you're being told the only way we can do this is if you, and there is no curve. Everybody's income, whatever you consume, you consume in the same ratio as you get richer, and everybody else is consuming the same stuff you are in the same ratio which means we're all consuming spam, even worse than baked beans, okay? There's only spam, okay? And we're talking about the relative price of spam in terms of spam, which becomes rather problematic. It's a contradiction, and that's what they should have realised it was. Now, that's all nonsense, and if we believe this stuff, you've got to be delusional to some degree, and delusions can come out of being so deeply inside your own analysis that you can't see any alternative, and this is what you were talking about to some extent and covering how uh, the uh, Smiths and Rooters reacted to their problems. But this is how Gorman put it. The necessary and sufficient condition quoted above is intuitively reasonable. Intuitively reasonable. It says, in effect, an extra unit of purchasing power should be spent in the same way, no matter to whom it is given. It's not intuitive reasonable. It's bullshit. Okay? In other words, that should have been a point at which they said, we can't build micro from mac- macro from micro. But no, they kept on going. But Ramsey wasn't to know that. Now, the people who come after him should have known that, and that should have been a point where we threw it away. Now, one thing, the second assumption I want to spend a fair bit of time on, because something that occurred to me while I was reading this nonsense. Sorry, guys, but it's anybody who believes this stuff, it's nonsense. Um, is that he, Ramsey made another assumption that you can ignore the distribution of income when you're considering long-term growth. Now, that seems, that is a less unreasonable assumption than the other ones about representing the entire society with a single utility service. But if you look at Goodwin's 1967 growth model, which is the foundation of my work in post-Keynesian modelling, uh, what the Wikipedia explains here quite nicely, with a slightly different model, is that cycles result in lower long-term growth. So here's the way the Wikipedia shows it. What you have there is a potential gross output level, which is rising nice and exponentially, and a total uh, actual gross output, which is lower. Now, part of the reason they've got that is they include savings out of out of um, profits, and I'm, um, I'm going to not, uh, not do that. Um, but I want to show that if you look at Goodwin's model, you know, why would neoclassicals worry about a post-Keynesian model? They wouldn't. They wouldn't even know it exists. I've had personal experience of that with, uh, with dealing with neoclassicals. Um, but I can derive Gordon's model from strictly true macroeconomic definitions. So I want to take you through that and then show you how to handle the dynamics of that and what that implies, first of all, for this assumption, and then for how neoclassicals um, do their own modelling. So if, if you can derive it from definitions, then it applies to any model. Okay? And that's the point I want to show, show here. And that, what that means is the only way the distribution of income doesn't affect long-term growth is if the economy is always in equilibrium. Now, that's cool for a neoclassical. They're happy to assume that. But I want to point out that if that doesn't apply, they're wrong about ignoring distribution. So Goodwin's model starts from two definitions. The wage a share of GDP, which is, I use omega for that, for that uh, ratio, W divided by Y, total wage bill divided by total GDP. And the employment rate, total population, total labour force divided by total population. Now you can convert them into dynamic statements, which is still definitional, and by taking the rate of change of those and not not doing any assumptions 
uh, you simply say let's go through the logic. So the little hat means one over W to W, one over omega the omega dc. One of the hat is the percentage rate of change effectively, without the percent, but it's it's a fractional rate of change. One over something is something dc is something with a hat over the top of it. So what you get is that's going to you've got one over omega, so that you have to, you just you reverse that around, it becomes y over omega over here times the rate of change of the ratio. Expand, you've now got this, you're going to start with cancelling this one. You've got 1 over y, because you've got, to, to do the, the, the product rule here, you've got 1 over y times gw dc, and then you've got to do the inverse here. I, I spell this out rather than using the quotient rule. You get one minus w over y times 1 over y dy dt. Now that, of course, is the growth rate. Here we've got the rate of change of the wages bill. Now what I'm going to do is some cancellations here. So what you've got is that y cancels with that y, that y, that uh, y of w, they, they cancel. So you come down to a simple expression saying the rate of change of wages share of GDP is the rate of growth of wages minus the rate of growth of GDP. That's just a fact. That's all it's saying. It's a fact. Um, now for the rate of change of employment is slightly more complicated. But I start from the same basic point of view. You start from saying it's 1 over lambda to lambda dt. The well, lambda is L by N, so 1 over lambda is N by, by L. You've then got another product rule to go through here. If you expand that out, you then start getting plenty of cancellations. The N over the N cancels. The N L over L and also cancel. You finally get another expression that makes plenty of sense, saying the employment rate will rise as the workforce grows faster than population. So they're still facts. Okay, they're not they're not a model as yet, but they're an undisputable facts. Any neoclassical challenge is that they're challenging facts, not not an alternative model. So those two statements are there. Now you've got to add some assumptions to make it into a model. So one thing I've got to bring is a definition of labour productivity, and that's simply defining A as Y divided by L. So it's not quite in the same category as the definition of wages, share and employment, but it's a definitional statement. And then if you only have two social classes, one capitalist, the other workers, then profit's going to be output minus wages. It's more complicated when you include bankers in there, of course, which is what I do with my Minsky model. Um, so profit share is then that all that divided by Y. So you've got a profit share is one minus the wages share of GDP. So, so that's a fairly minor bit of additional elements. The next thing I'm going to assume is constant uh, technological change, which again, I can make it variable as Roma did, but it's rather more the feedback between investment and the rate of growth of, uh, rate of, rate of technical change. And population growth being constant alpha and beta. And a uniform real wage. So presume that the wage bill is equal to a uniform wage multiplied by how many workers there are. And then the simplest possible production model you can have saying, um, output is a function of capital stock divided by the capital output ratio. Uh, investment adds to capital stock and depreciation reduces it. And then some behavioural, I've got capitalists investing all their profits, which was Goodwin's original assumption. And of course that's extreme. They will invest more than their profits during a boom and less during a slump. But this is a, a first approximation. And workers consume all their wages. Okay. So what capitalists are doing is investing and what workers are doing is consuming. Notice that that is a difference to the neoclassicals who lump them all together. Okay. So, and of course the neoclassical might object here because I haven't got any fine tuning, um, but that particular rejoinder has a few problems. One is that their own theories don't work anyway. Their theories ignore the distribution of income. Okay. So that they've got no, they've got no real role criticising a simple assumption about the distribution of income, what people do with it. Um, and it's akin to a first-order Taylor expansion. If you had a more complicated model of consumer behaviour, then you're going to have a constant plus a first term. This is like the first term. So to say workers consume all their wages and uh, capitalists invest all their profits is the first element in a Taylor series expansion, which could fit a neoclassical idea of utility maximising behaviour by those two social classes. Now, if you're near equilibrium, the linear terms in a Taylor series expansion dominate the nonlinear. So because x is greater than 
x, x, if x is less than 1, then x squared is less than x, and x cubed is less than x squared, and so on. So very near the equilibrium, um, this, uh, this simplification works. So I bring in wage change being a linear function of the employment rate, and insert those into our definitions, and what I get out of that is this, I've now broken into, remember I've broken into those two terms, the rate of change of the wages bill and rate of change of GDP. Well, the latter one turns up all the time, so I'll call that G, and you then, that's now 1 over Y, well, I've got the relationship for capital and output, so I can substitute the Ys with Ks. I'm going through and do my cancellations now, so the Vs cancel, so 1 over K to KDT, that's the investment minus depreciation. Substitute that all profits are invested, so I whack profit in place of investment. Expand out that, uh, that K is V times Y in the first equation. That gives you your profit share down here, and that's depreciation. So you finally get the rate of growth is 1 minus the wages share divided by the capital output ratio minus depreciation. That's your, that's your actual rate of growth. The first component, again, is more complicated. So you take 1 over W, the capital W, which is the total wage bill, break it into the wage rate times the level of employment, expand using the product rule. Um, you get plenty of cancellations of W and, and, uh, and L through all those equations. You finally get down to, uh, you've now got rate of change of labour force plus the rate of change of wages being added together. The second part is your Phillips curve relationship. Rate of change of wages, that's the Phillips curve, the linear Phillips curve here. Uh, if you replace Y and A with A and L, then you can actually cancel this equation out, as you'll see in a moment. So I expand this whole bit. That's the, expanding, that, that's the entire expansion. All the cancellations that occur are here. So what you finally get is that's the rate of growth minus the rate of growth, rate, 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 the first is the rate of growth of the economy minus the rate of technical change. I've already worked those two out. So you can finally collapse this down. And you've started with this expression, put them all together, the bits in red cancel, and you get to this exchange equation for the wages share. So the rate of change of wages is the Phillips curve minus uh, labour productivity. So if, if wage demands exceed labour productivity, wages will rise. That's all that's saying. Again, it's quite a simple statement. Now, put it all together as differential equations. There's your equation for the wages share, and that's inherently nonlinear because you're multiplying two system states together. You've got omega multiplied by lambda. Okay? That's a, a, quad, a semi-quadratic um, nonlinearity. The reason I've gone through this, it's a laborious way of deriving it, but it doesn't take long. Okay? The amount of time that I take to do this is about 10 minutes. Uh, I think if you try to derive it, you know, get to the same point in a DSG model, you better roll out 10 weeks, and I'll show you a bit of that later on. Um, so it's, it's well-founded because you're working from strictly true macroeconomic definitions. You've got simplifying assumptions which are genuine. They are simplifying and you can expand them later. Um, and it therefore applies, this, this simple set of models applies to any model that's trying to represent the macro economy. So the point I'm trying to raise here, does distribution of income matter for long-term growth? Okay. Um, well, I'm getting slightly at that point. So I've got this expression now for the employment. Again, the same set of cancellations apply. I finally get down to saying that the rate of change of the employment rate is the rate of the growth of the economy minus labour productivity and population growth. That's what that equation comes down to. And again, it's inherently nonlinear. I've got to get that multiplication of two system states. Now with a minus in there, so you've got lambda times minus omega, which is what gives you the cycles we see. So finally, this is your total model. Now, you want to work out what the equilibrium is, well, it's where the rate of change of those two is zero. So, I now presume there's an omega E and a lambda E. 
and I know to fit them together. Well, one possibility is they're both zero because I'm multiplying term out of brackets, so that's the, the trivial equilibrium. The non-trivial is that lambda e, the final expression, this bit, is equal to zero, and also this bit equal to zero. So I go through and work those out. And I've now got what the equilibrium, if that's the equilibrium, then this is the equilibrium growth path as well. And when you look at it, what actually happens here, I've got the growth rate, 1 minus WE, which I've worked that up here. You feed that in, and look at the cancellations that occur. 1 minus 1 there, that's gone. V divided by V, that's gone. Delta plus R, and we've plus B, is minus uh, delta the depreciation. There's your simple equation. In equilibrium, the rate of growth of the economy will be the sum of technical change and population growth, which again is the sort of thing a neoclassical come up with as well. It's not at all outside um, the purview of a neoclassical way of thinking. Now, with, the, with Goodwin's model, you can actually simulate it out of equilibrium. Neoclassicals have a hell of a time simulating models in equilibrium, and I'll show you a bit of that. Not as much as I would have liked, because I said I ran out of time, uh, but I'll, I'll cover that hopefully uh, in later later work that I'll do. But this is a good one. This is a Minsky model. I'll bring it up. So the definitions I've shown you, the derivation of beforehand, and now in a model. Oh. I've got to show that to Russell. Sometimes the models seem to crash when I'm now trying to load from um, the rate. Uh-huh. Beta versions of software. I'll have to go and find out what's wrong with that later. But I'll show you check through the of Lanham model here. Here's the definition of the wage of share, done as a flowchart in Minsky. This is the definition of the employment share. This is the actual growth rate, and that's the equilibrium growth rate. So the red line is the equilibrium growth rate. The varying one is the actual growth rate. When you look at growth GDP versus actual, equilibrium GDP versus actual, the actual catches up with it at the peak of every boom. But the gap between those two curves is lost output, and that lost output grows over time. So if you're in equilibrium, then the distribution of income has no impact. But if you're out of equilibrium, it does affect long-term growth. So again, another one of the simplifying assumptions that, that Ramsey made does not apply in the environment he was looking at, which is trying to explain growth theory, growth over time. So. You can't ignore the distributional issues. So there's two assumptions that Wright and Ramsey made to build the model were both false. You can't represent an entire society's preferences with a single indifference, uh, indifferent surface, and you can't ignore distribution when you're looking at long-term growth. So, um, so all these things mean that they're badly founded. If you're in a genuine science, People would have told Ramsey, nice try, but unfortunately we found this idea doesn't work. It's, it's like having a model of chemistry that explains, uh, chemical, explains flames using phlogiston. It might fit the data, but it's wrong. Sorry, let's throw it out. Instead, it was made the basis for macro economic modeling. And that's, that's the situation we're in now. But even then, this is the part that I find amusing when neoclassicals try to push this obsession with equilibrium into everything they do. Um, they would like, if you think about what they'd like the market to do, they'd like the market to be something which gets us all to equilibrium regardless of what we, our actual behaviours are. So a bunch of bozos in a marketplace, the market will still reach an equilibrium price that makes the bozos as happy as they can afford to be given their, um, given their um, budget constraints. But that's not what happened. The model turned out to be unstable. Now, again, I'm going to cover... Goodwin's model here to a fair degree because I'll be using this in the next three lectures on post Keynesian work as well. But this is what you do with any, any standard dynamic model. The first thing you do is work out the model. The second thing you do is work out its, uh, its, its phase space dynamics. What, 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 what does, is it equal to, does it have, how many equilibria does it have? Are there attractors or repellers? 
Are there strange attractors in the system? This is what somebody working in complex systems does first off. So there are two equilibria. I showed you those. As it happens, the zero equilibrium is unstable. If you start there, you move away from it. Um, what about the, 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 the stable equilibrium? What's that happen to be? We work it out by linearizing. And again, this is what I covered briefly earlier on. And that is, if you're trying to work out the stability around an equilibrium, then around an equilibrium, if you can take all your nonlinear system and produce it into a Taylor series expansion, the linear term dominates. The nonlinear term is not as important. When you move further away, the nonlinear terms dominate. Okay, so a genuinely nonlinear model will not necessarily break down because the dynamics will bring it to return it back towards the equilibrium after it's moved away by being repelled by the linear components here. But what you do, first of all, is do this linearization. Now, a linearized version of this equation and that equation is the Jacobian matrix. Who's heard of the Jacobians here? Who hasn't? Okay. What a Jacobian is, it's named after the person, I think his name was Jacobi, uh, the first, we first worked it out. If you've got a dynamic system, then you can, you, you know the idea of differentiating a single function. Okay. Well, if you have two equations, two equations with two, two equations with two system states, you've got to differentiate it four times. Okay. Each equation against each of the, of the system states. So whereas a simple differentiation differentiates one equation against one causal variable, this is differentiating two equations against two causal variables. And what it comes down to is just the, the linearized version is this first thing called a Jacobian. The second is called a Hessian. There are higher orders as well. But you're simply extrapolating from what you do for a single equation to what you do for multiple equations, and therefore you get a, a, you get a matrix you've got to do the differentials for rather than a single scalar uh, system. So you evaluate them at the equilibrium. I already know the equilibrium. Worked that out a moment ago. Oh, that's badly animated there. So the Jacobian, the basic matrix, a basic good one is, uh, I'm, I've got the, in this case, I've got the omega, the differentials going down the columns and the equations going across the rows. And that's what you need to make sure you've got. It doesn't matter which way you do it. So if you do it, if you do the, Differentials across and the equations down, it still gives you exactly the same characteristic matrix. So that's the omega dt, uh, the dd omega of the expression for omega, and dd going across the road, dd lambda, the expression for omega. Then you have dd omega, the expression for lambda, and dd lambda, the expression for lambda, where you know you fit in the equilibrium values. Well, we've already worked out what they are for the previous part of the equation, so I feed those in. Um, and I make the substitutions that lambda e, they've now got what lambda e is, we've, we've worked it out earlier, and what omega e is, feed those into the equation, and what you get, again, a whole range of cancellations, you come down finally to what I should have animated first off, this matrix, zeros on the, the, on the trace of the matrix, and these two terms off the trace. So that's, that's, that's the matrix now that describes the linear model around the equilibrium. Uh, but again, I've got my animations out of order here, so I'll fix that up later. Now that's matrix A, and you, you're, you're a small distance away from the equilibrium, we'll call Z. So you're, are you going to, if you're a slight difference away from the equilibrium, will you move towards it or away from it? That's the way to change this distance Z. So Z's a matrix, it's got two elements in it. You're, you know, you may maybe maybe 2% above the uh, wages share that's in equilibrium and 3% below the employment rate. So your Z is those two numbers in a, in a uh, vector. Are you going to converge back to equilibrium or are you going to go away from it again? But you've got to have a guess answer. In any differential equation, the guess answer is an exponential. If you say, um, we've got dz dt equals a times z. I'm abusing mathematical notation a bit here. It says 1 over z dz dt equals a, your solution's an exponential. But now it's an exponential involving a matrix rather than just a single number. So you have a guess solution to this, um, which is that there's another a constant called lambda. So that, that's, that's the vector version of the equation. This is like the scalar version. So the lambda is saying that both these other factors are growing at the same rate or shrinking at the same rate. And lambda, because it's now going to give me a quadratic, lambda's going to have two values. 
So I now expand this equation now using matrix terms. So I've got lambda multiplied by the identity matrix times z minus a multiplied by the uh, a multiplied by z is equal to two zeros. And that's that's your overall condition for the stability well the characteristics of this linearized version. So I now feed that now I've got lambda, a matrix consisting of lambda on the horizontal axis, on the on the trace, the, the diagonal of the matrix, and these two terms off the trace. And then somehow you, you, you're working with a non-zero z. You're some definite distance away from the equilibrium, okay? But somehow it's, this whole thing has to be equal to zero. Well, the only way it's feasible is that this equation, this matrix, somehow is like zero. And the way it's like zero is you can't invert zero. What's, what's the inverse of one over zero? What's, what's the inverse of zero? It's not defined, okay? One over zero is not a number. Same thing applies here. There's something about inverting the matrix that gives you an effect like zero, and that's where it's what's called its determinant is zero. And there's a set of very stylized rules for building a determinant. In this case, for the two types of matrix, it's the di elements on the diagonal multiplied by each other minus the elements on the off-diagonal multiplied by each other. So it's quite simple. It's lambda squared minus the, third, minus the two off-diagonal terms multiplied together. So you do that, and you've now got a quadratic. Now, I, I haven't gone, I should have actually gone through and added that. I didn't realize I hadn't added that properly. Let's just take a look again. Okay. Uh, you can do a quadratic solution to this. And you, when you do the quadratic, one thing which turns, actually I can put it out from the equation there itself. That's just basically a quadratic. But say that's x squared minus constant minus x. Well, there's no, there's no, it's no x squared minus two times x plus a constant. So that term is missing. So the only way that can happen is if there's um, no real term, okay? No, um, it's, it's, you know, I'm going to leave it in here and you go to see it like whole. But there's only complex roots for this. So if I solve it and put in numerical values, and here's the first one I've got is, I've got a, um, a capital output ratio of three, which is roughly right. 2% and 1.5% for technical change of population growth. 6% for depreciation, the slope of the workers' wage function being 10, and when 60% of the workforce has got a job, there's no wage change. It's fairly realistic parameter values. That gives you a quadratic which doesn't cross the x-axis. Therefore, it's solutions of complex numbers. If I put in ridiculous numbers over here, I would have, for example, a capital output ratio of 20, which is far higher than exists, or I have a depreciation rate of 40%, which is far higher than appreciation, then I can get real values, and notice one is negative and the other is positive. So we can pretty much rule them out, but they're absurd. you need absurd values for parameters to get that case. So what you get is a solution for the Goodman model involving two complex numbers. Now, they will converge. In other words, you have no real part to this model. There's, you get a real solution when the quadratic crosses the x-axis. Because it doesn't cross the x-axis, you've only got a complex answer to it. So the real part of the solution is zero. The real part tells you whether you're pushing away or being pulled towards equilibrium. Since the real part is zero, you're not being pulled or pushed. You stay in the same rotation. So the model, I'll just go back and show that. Oh, now we've got a hassle actually. Let's see if I do it this way. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, that, I didn't know, it would emphasize this enough last, when I first went through it, but you've got a permanent cycle. The wages share and the employment rate cycle around indefinitely. There's your equilibrium, you're actually cycling around it permanently, you're remaining the same distance away from equilibrium. At all. You're the same distance away all the way through, so you, you need a conversion or diverge. Now that's one of several dynamic states, I'll show you a couple of others later. Um, so that's that's the cyclical nature of the model. Um, and there's a range of different possibilities you have for how a model can be. If you have a two-dimensional system and both its 
what are called eigenvalues, which are what those, the roots of that quadratic equation are called the eigenvalues, then your system's globally stable. Around the, locally stable around the equilibrium. If you diverge a shawl amount, you'll go back to it again. Now think about neoclassical vision of the economy. That's what they want. Okay? They'd want a model that returned to equilibrium after a shock. But that's not what they got. Um, If they're both complex, then you get the cycles I've shown you in the Buddha model. You neither diverge nor diverge, so you've got to think in non-equilibrium terms. Now, I'm quite cool with that. I'm happy to think in non-equilibrium terms. That's what I think economics should be about non-equilibrium. Uh, if they're both positive, then it's unstable, but it can be in a non-linear system. You can be unstable at the equilibrium, but stable further away because the non-linear terms dominate when you move further away. Or you can have one positive and the other negative. So you have two, two roots, and again, again, notice that um, when I go back to that vision, there we are, uh, when I've got those ridiculous values for capital for uh, capital upward ratio or depreciation, then I get two values, two points where the parabola crosses the x-axis. Okay? And as it happens, in the Gooden model, that would be both one positive or the other negative. Now, that's what neoclassical's got. I'm sure if you asked Ramsey before he started working at his mathematics, what sort of equilibrium do you want? Oh, one that's stable, obviously. That's not what he got. And this is one of the terrible things about mathematics. It doesn't do what you want it to do. It does what's yeah. true. Okay. Now that's why I use, that's why I think economics, we need mathematics and economics because if you do it properly, it undermines this neoclassical nonsense. It doesn't strengthen it. They're not doing mathematics. They're doing mathematics. But Ramsey's model ultimately came down to two factors. Consumption, which was growing over time, uh, and there's an optimal growth rate given the trade-off between leisure and work for the consumer, and then capacity to produce it, also growing over time, and that involves a trade-off between investment and consumption. And you can see how those two overlap with each other. And he talked about, and this is one thing you would have found strange in reading at this idea of a bliss point, okay? But it's the idea of this, this ultimate point of maximum satisfaction. Um, and that, in a, in, a, in a modern terms, would be a point of equilibrium between those two factors. Now, he would have liked that bliss point to be stable. And neoclassicals, of the, if, if, if Sargent and friends had gone back and found that Ramsey gave them a stable equilibrium, they would have been cock a hoop, here we go, equilibrium modelling is possible because we've shown the equilibrium is stable. Because if you have a system like this uh, and it's linear, which most of their models are, then a linear model... If it's stable, no matter where you start from, you'll end up in equilibrium. And that would be, you could have limited knowledge by agents, that wouldn't be a problem. Okay. But, in fact, the point is unstable. And I want to, what I'll largely be showing you in this lecture is why it's unstable, because they can't even do what I've done for the Goodwin model. Okay, It's numerically impossible and symbolically impossible to do what I've done for the Goodwin model here. If you finally get two... Uh, differential equations, one for consumption per head over time and one for change in ca capital labour ratio. They, they, they conflate together labour and labour productivity in this thing they call K. So you put that together, you get two key equations. And by the way, there are some very good slides by the neoclassicals explaining all this. Um, what I found strange was I was, was looking for conclusions to bring this stuff together. And in fact, where I expect a bit of mathematical derivation to continue, suddenly there's a, there's a, there's a hand-drawn phase diagram. The reason is they couldn't build the solution. The, the, they're, they're insoluble, and I want to talk a bit about that and the problems that generates for them as well. But here's their set of equations for the, um, uh, the two key system states of the Ramsey model, which becomes the basis of real business cycle models, which becomes the basis of... Uh, DSG model. So there's the rate of change of the capital labour ratio. There's your production function. There's depreciation. And there's rate of population growth. I've left out uh, a technical change one just to make the notation easier to follow. But they do have one where they have the rate of growth of technical progress turning up later. Here you have the rate of change of consumption per capita. This is a complex parameter that they talk about it measuring your desire to smooth your consumption over time. It's made variable in some of the 
I think that Asimoglu makes it very well. In a very good book of non-neoclassical macro model by a guy called Roth, he shows it has to be a constant over the long term. Can't make it time varying. So I've used, to make it simple, I've used Roth's notation here rather than Asimoglu's. And that's the rate of time preference. Okay. And they had various rules about what can be bigger and smaller than all these parameters themselves as well. Uh, and this is the, the first derivative of the production function. Now, because you're talking about diminishing marginal productivity, that's positive but declining over time. Okay. So if you think about the, when they do, when they draw the Cobb Douglas production function, okay, they get diminishing marginal productivity. So if you add more capital, you get an increase in output but a decreasing rate. And if you look at the second derivative, that's negative. Okay, because it's always getting smaller. And that becomes important when they try to do their stability analysis. So here are your two equations. And you've got to do the same thing. Evaluate the Jacobian at equilibrium, which I'm just calling KE and CE here. So here's your expression. I now feed in that K has to be equal to KE and C equal to C wherever they turn up here once I've done the differentiations that are involved. So I did the differentiations, and this is the differential of fk, of the production function with respect to k. So I get the slope of the um, production function evaluated at the equilibrium point. I've got k times n times k here, so the k just drops off, the c disappears. For this one, I've got the differential of k with respect to k. That's going to be the second differential. Now, that's important that that's negative multiplying by this consumption relationship here. So I get that expression down here. Differentiating this one with respect to C, C only turns up once, so I get minus one is my coefficient. And over here, differentiate this with respect to C, C turns up here, I get the whole lot of that also with the constant inside there. Okay. So that's all looking good so far. Then they substitute in equilibrium values. Now, why would you do that when you're out of equilibrium? Okay, but that's what they have to do to actually be able to make another step. So in their equilibrium model, so the, the, the rate of time preference is actually equal to the marginal productivity of, of capital adjusted for depreciation. So they have this requirement that in equilibrium, this is going to apply. Now, they're not in equilibrium. Okay, but you know, the, because they're using F at KE, okay, it's, it's not too bad to do it here. So they then say, well, as F dash at KE, minus n times k over here, we've now got this substitution we can make. So we do that. And this expression here, given that, that's zero. So you now get a, um, this one, you've got rid of um, f dash ke, you've got rho minus n, rho is the time rate of time preference, n is the rate of population growth. Now they one of their requirements again to avoid corner solutions they don't want is the rate of time preference is greater than the rate of growth of population. So that's one of the rules. We know that's going to be a positive. This one here is a negative. Okay. Zero. What's this one? Well, they don't know. They can't work it out. I'll show you why in a moment. But what they do know is this is the second differential of the production function, therefore it must be negative. So you get a negative and a negative on the off diagonal. You're going to get a plus overall coming out of this, as you'll see in a moment. So the linearized version, the same thing I've done for the Goodwin model, is Z dt equals A times Z, where this is now A. I then feed in my, I'm now making the polynomial expansion, so lambda times the identity matrix times Z minus A times Z equal to double zero. Bring it inside, and now I've got my key equation here. I'll just go back again, pardon me. So there's my equation. Now when I do, when I, when I multiply this by lambda, so I'm going to get lambda squared minus that times lambda. The meaning, of course, there is going to be a term, if you think of it in terms of a, a typical quadratic AX squared plus BX plus C, there's going to be a term in B. Okay? That which wasn't there in the Goodman model. So you're going to get a real term turning up in the overall um, quadratic that explains the whether the system is stable or unstable. Let's do that. This is, I'm going to go slightly further in a later slide, but you can't go any further there because they can't work out uh, what CE and KE are. 
I'll show you the, the reason for that towards the end of the lecture. But they can't get an analytic solution for that. Now, you saw I got a very simple analytic solution for the Goodwin model, for the equilibrium value of C, and of in, in his case, of omega and lambda. Here you can't work out an analytic, so what can you do? Well, all you can do is say, and you, and you can't solve the root quadratic either, that's insoluble. Um, so, of course, again, this is saying this is not what they wanted. They would have been much happier to get the soluble, we can work out what it is, and we converge to it. It's insoluble. You can only work out what it is by a very complicated iterative numerical process, which is why solving these models numerically takes so long. Um, but what do they do? Well, they try to make a virtue out of it because um, they say that this is an unstable saddle node solution. I'll put unstable in there deliberately. They think it's stable, which is an intriguing thought, and I'll, I'll show you what their, their, their logic is there. They say, well, F dash double K is negative, and because of our assumption that the rate of time preference is greater than the rate of growth of population, that's also a positive. So you get lambda minus positive here, and you've got, over here you've got a negative times another negative. So you get a positive term. Oh, sorry, no, you get a, you get a negative term overall because it's, it's, it's the diagonals multiplied by the other minus the off diagonals. But the off diagonals are both negative, so you're going to get a negative. Pardon me. What you get is your general form. Lambda minus A, positive constant, minus B, minus 1 and lambda. Generically, this is going to be the nature of the solution to the Ramsey stroke RBC stroke PSG equilibrium. You can factor that into two terms, one of which is going to be negative, the other positive. This one is going to give you a stable root. That's going to be unstable. That's where your saddle comes from. Now, when you look at the various shapes that a dynamic system can take for two, two, two dimensions. Um, the first is you have, if there are two distinct real eigenvalues, which there are in this case, if they're both positive or both negative, you're either st stable everywhere or unstable everywhere. There's a couple of, these are what are called degenerative forms over here. The main one I want to look at is here. This is the saddle. Two distinct real eigenvalues of opposite sign. Notice what the, what the mathematicians say about it. That is always unstable. That's a mathematician's view of a saddle. It's an unstable point. And if you look at what's actually going on there, um, then you will you will never reach that equilibrium. But how do neoclassicals get to the equilibrium? Well, first of all, they say they take the value of k as a given. So they assume we, we have an initial capital stock, and that can't be changed. So we take that as a given. The consumption is what they call a jump variable. We can instantly decide to consume a lot more or a lot less. Okay? And then what, what do we do? Well, we're working out how to consume. Now, what is, how do you decide when you go shopping? What's the first thing you think of? It's obvious, isn't it? You think of the rate of time preference and the rate of term return and then, and the infinite future of all your decisions. Mathematicians are quite happy to say that a satellite is always unstable. But the neoclassicals say, oh, well, we're fixed K, but C is a jump variable. So you can jump from C instantly to any other point. You don't have to follow along a trajectory you're currently on. And notice all these lines here are showing a, a trajectory space. So if you start here and you're going to deviate, there's your equilibrium. You're going to deviate away from it. And this is a this is the stable node of the saddle. That's like the part along the spine of the horse. This part here is like going off the edge of the horse. What the neoclassical says, well, you can instantly change from some consumption point to another. So here's a, another view of the same diagram. You're at a particular level of consumption before some shock to technology or preferences comes along. And that will get you to another point in future, which is another stable saddle. Then this shock to preferences occurs, or shock to technology. The saddle moves in time, far in the distant future, you know, maybe maybe a couple of hundred years ago, or oh, maybe maybe a hundred years, let's say. Well, what you do is you then instantly work out where the what the, the stable node of the saddle is for this new location of the saddle, and you jump there, and then over time, converge over time to that equilibrium. That's the way, that's what they see as dynamics. Um, 
Now, the problem about that is that to work out what you're going to consume today, and this is why I asked the question, how do you decide when you go shopping? Okay. You need to calculate that future equilibrium point. And they will write this in their documents because they've become so inured to thinking in this way, they don't realise how outlandishly absurd these assumptions are. This is from Groth. Um, current consumption cannot be determined independently of the expected entire future evolution of the economy. Holy shit! I mean, you can imagine if Hayek was alive today, he wouldn't be waving a rap against Keynes, he'd be having a rap against the neoclassicals. Um, consumption and saving depend upon expectation of the future path of wages and interest rates. Given the presumption of rational expectations, here in the form of perfect foresight, the uh, house's expectations are identical to the predictions from the model. So what we're all doing, we're all DSGE models, all with infinite knowledge of the future. And that's how we might decide to go shopping at Kmart, or whatever you call it over here. Um, so there's mutual dependence between the two. We can only determine the level of consumption only in the context of the overall dynamic analysis. This is what they call the Euler equation. Uh, in fact, the economic agents are in the same situation as the modeler. They have to think of the entire dynamics of the economy including mutual uh, dependency, in order to form their rational expectations. Now, of course, as I've said several times this past, this is an abuse of the word rational. This is not rational, this is prophetic expectations. So what it's saying is if we're all capable of infinite prophecy, the market will reach equilibrium. But if we're capable of prophecy, you need a market. And again, this is what they, they haven't got their heads around. So it's in, I haven't. This is what a part I would have liked to get time to do, but I simply haven't had time to go through how they actually derive a model from all this. It involves starting off from the idea of utility maximising behaviour by the individual, profit maximising behaviour by the firm. Then you get a whole range of transformations of equilibrium assumptions to get to the point where you can say, well, you've got to use particular utility functions again because only some what they call constant risk-return-adjusted uh, utility preferences actually will converge. You've got to get particular mathematical forms to make it work. So all these arbitrary assumptions are there when the large part of the reason we're trying to get away from CGE modelling and Hicks's modelling was to avoid arbitrary stuff. But they need arbitrary stuff to get to their new solution, but they're no longer aware of it. Um, so here's just an idea of what the final models look like. This is a very good set of lectures by the Bank of England some years ago. And it comes down to three very simple equations. When you take a look at them, there's nothing, in terms of the number of terms, there's not much interest rate based on a deviation of the inflation rate from desired inflation rate. Consumption by uh, the households involving a discount terms, time to expect the utility, and I'll just talk about this term, uh, and the interest rate and the, infl and the inflation rate down here. Uh, I think this is, this, this is like what they call their, their Phillips curve, modified Phillips curve. But notice there's a slight problem here. These are difference equations. And the normal way one writes a difference equation is the value at xt depends upon the value at xt minus 1t minus 2t minus 3, etc., etc. Uh -uh. Here, utility of consumption of t depends upon consumption of t plus 1. And the inflation rate in t plus 1. The wage of the, the, work, the firm's contribution depends upon uh, inflation in T plus 1. So it's not, a, it's not the usual difference equation where you iterate forward from past data. You've got to iterate backwards from future data you don't know, unless you assume you know the future, which, of course, is what they do. Mm -hmm. So you require knowledge of XT plus 1 to decide what you do in XT. That's, what they, that's why they call the mathematics recursive. That's one term they'll use for it. Because they, with enormous computational power and complicated routines, work out the numerical value for the equilibrium in the far future. That gives them their consumption and um, the capital level that way, way in the future. And they iterate back for the consumption by iterating forward for the capital stock to solve the overall model. So here's your terms where you've got, you know, it's not the only ones, but two of the vital ones where what happens now depends on what's going to happen next year. So to solve it, you've got to calculate this infinite future. Um, symbolic, this is symbolically insoluble and numerically unstable equilibrium. You've got to calculate that and then iterate back from it to work out the model, which is why it takes so damn long to solve these things. So this is uh, the paper from the um, 
Uh, actually, uh, there's a, a newspaper called the Central Banker, and what the New York Fed has done in recent years is translate the model from MATLAB, which is what they used to use, with a preprocessor called Dynair. They're going across to an open source language called Julia. MATLAB costs about $2,000 a copy. So they wanted to make it open source and access, which is a good thing. And here's the journalist from the magazine said so he could test it on my laptop. Well, you make sure you've got time to spare. Optimization, 24 hours it was still running. Um, and computing the Hessian, they've got to go to, because they've got to go to that second differential. Okay, that's what the Hessian matrix is about. Took another day in my case, somewhat longer than the 10 to 12 hours for the New York Fed. There's an enormous amount of computation because equilibrium is unstable, but they want it to be stable, so they force it through these bizarre convolutions about the nature of dynamic modeling. So they've been after the financial crisis, of course. They, they were, most of them were so confident they understood the economy before the financial crisis. They were genuinely in a serious state of shock when it came along. If it was, again, they'll often work out, um, with their models, they'll work out a, 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 a envelope around their actual point prediction, which is saying what the range is likely to be. Well, this was so far outside the range. Their models just couldn't make sense of what actually happened. And they really were in a state of crisis. And then with that shock, to their belief in the real world, some of them started to think logically. I don't know what Calavera has been, Calavera has been like since he wrote this, but this was extremely sensible. He said some strange herding processes occurred over time. We've transformed from useful modeling shortcuts into an artificial reality, um, which eventually replaces reality. So they're worried about the internal consistency of the model and not how it actually fits the real world or explains the real world. Along the way, this process of make-believe substitution, again, this is very similar to Roma's arguments, uh, but were written well before Roma. Uh, our presumption of knowledge, and here he's referring to Hayek, okay, and Hayek's idea of the, the, the presumption of knowledge, the fallacy of presumption of knowledge, which he, which he gave in his Nobel Prize speech, uh, raises our presumption of knowledge about the workings of the complex economy and increases the risk of a pretense of knowledge. So agents could be fully rational about the local environment and everyday activities, and that's what when you when we say rational, that's what we mean. You're a rational consumer. Yeah, you buy. You look at what you've got in your pocket. You buy what you feel like, given those constraints. You might be thinking about, you know, how long before the next paycheck and stuff like that, and so on. That's locally rational behaviour. What they end up with is having the model is based on believing that people are doing incredibly complex computations, which even the Fed takes 10 to 12 hours to run on its computer with a model, developed model of the economy in its in its computing system. That still takes a couple of days to solve. We're supposed to be doing that when we go shopping in a five-minute break in the middle of a lecture and my laptop goes flat. It is just insane. So he says, we're assuming they're knowledgeable about things they're probably clueless about. And the model won't work unless they are that knowledgeable. And that's the fallacy. So he said, maybe I'm being too impatient. Maybe we're slowly getting there to this El Dorado. And that's what, if you, again, if you read the pre-crisis literature, things like, like for example, uh, Blanchard's paper, uh, The State of Macro, which he, he released in August of 2008 and actually said the state of macro was good, you know, one year after the crisis began. I think he's, he's, got, he's got a lot better. I must say Blanchard has got a lot better since then. We've had some very polite and, and, and gen- sensible conversation through Twitter on occasion, so I've got you know, some time for him, but at the time he was quite confident, as they all were, that they were approaching this El Dorado. Well, after it, he said, this is uh, Cavallaro saying, well, this incremental strategy may have overshot its peak. As we, you've got a huge complex landscape, you're trying to get the highest peak on that landscape. You might just be stuck in a, in a valley, a valley of darkness. Uh, rather than being realistic, we're digging ourselves one step at a time, deeper and deeper into a fantasy land, with economic agents who can solve richer and richer stochastic general equilibrium problems containing all sorts of frictions. So what's being assumed is, because the market won't get you this point of equilibrium, your intellectual capability will. At which point, why have a market? And you'll, if you read the papers, part of what they see is an equivalence between the perfectly competitive model and what they call the central planner. So they flip between talking about a central planner and perfect competition as if they're equivalent. They're both involving the idea of infinite knowledge, which again comes back to the pretense of knowledge 
and now I explain this. Now, that's a sensible reaction. This is a very recent paper uh, with Cahoe, who's one of the main characters who created all this stuff. He's saying, well, there's no crisis, no massive failure, and I, I really like this particular, that's why I've highlighted it, no need for undisciplined frictions and shocks. The only thing they can think about doing is adding frictions and shocks to an equilibrium model. They can't consider what about endogenous dynamics, what about complex systems. It's not in their mindset to be able to think that way. So they think they're being quite quite progressive and, and they're inclusive. They don't need to change anything. And I think here's with Caballero's insight is, is very important. They've been gradually doing this over time. And each particular additional step is taken on board. Maybe people question at the time, but then it's formalised in some sense. People use the formalisation without checking to see where it came from or what it actually implies, and you end up in the madness. So because the progress is gradual, we do not seem to notice, as we accept what are increasingly absurd behavioural conventions and stretch the intelligence and information of underlying economic agents to levels that render them unrecognisable. That really summarises the entire venture. So they've arrived at a methodology which has inured them to how absurd the methodology itself is because the mathematics did not give the results they wanted. They would have liked Volra's equilibrium to be stable. So we look at, look at where they've come from. The neoclassicals, would, would, you certainly can't regard Smith as the, uh, the founding father of neoclassical economics. He rejected quite explicitly utility-based theories of people's behaviour of, of the marketplace. But he did have this metaphor of invisible hand. I'm, I'm sure most neoclassicals haven't read it to realise that actually he, in, in, the, in the Wealth of Nations when he used the phrase, he was using it to argue that if you drop tariffs, producers wouldn't all move offshore to Portugal and export back to England. And he was using the ideas of national sensibility rather than the market mechanism. But he still used this phrase of an invisible hand, which is a phrase he liked. But notice the end part of it, led by an invisible hand for promoting the end, which was no part of his intention. In other words, so it's not you having your expectations fulfilled. Your expectations are not met, but what you do is better for society. You're being selfish, but you're leading to an outcome which is positive for the whole of society, which you weren't trying to do. So that's Smith's vision of the invisible hand. Okay. Then you have Walra, and he's a, what he's got is a simple groping. To term it literally means groping. You're groping in the dark, you start with some random price sequence. Can you get to equilibrium? Um, and all the Asians need is know in Valra's model was what commodities they owned and what the relative prices were and what their tastes were. You didn't even have to specify the tastes. It was just you know, there'll be these bids coming out again, so there was no need for utility maximising theory in Valra's model. Now, that would be great. The market would do all the work. Unfortunately, along comes Peron Trebenius, some 40 or 50 years later, to show that mathematically that process determined does not reach equilibrium. Okay. Then you have rational expectations, Ricardian equivalence. They're all tied together. The Ricardian equivalence idea is essential for these models to work. And what you've got is infinitely wise agents who are also prescient uh, and intend the outcomes that actually occur. So I think neoclassicals, by the slow process, have ended up in the other end of the cage to which they, they, were, they thought they were moving. Rather than explaining how the market solves everything and the market can bring together all these different ideas, the sort of stuff that Hayek talks about in his, his approach to the market, rather than that, they ended up at the other end, pardon me, it's one, one slide too many, at the other end where the Asians are so intelligent they could do whatever they damn well like. They don't need a marketplace. They know everything. What's the role of the market in this model? Now, that's what I've got to in terms of time. So that's unfortunately less than I wanted to cover. Um, but I want to just quickly show you why you can't get um, from from where uh, from there of Jacobian to a closed form solution because you've got to notice in this expression in the, in the Jacobian I've got the second differential the production function. Now, I, I didn't need anything like that with, with Goodwin's model. I simply had output as capital divided by labour out, capital output ratio, simple definition, um, in presuming full capacity utilisation. But again, as a first order approximation, that's fine. But they've got this. What do they do? Well, they've got to substitute what F is. So F of K, they're starting from the Cobb-Douglas, 
and then this particular, uh, in, in um, I think this is in um, Aslamogolo's explanation, he uses T for technology rather than A, which is normally, I think T is probably the more sensible. So they've got a Cobb Douglas reduction function, um, and if, you, if you've got, when they divide K by TL, they end up with this ratio of K. So they now get, A in this particular case, they're just a straight constant, doesn't involve technology anymore. So if you do your differentiation, you get, uh, the first differential gives you A multiplied by alpha by so chi k to the 1 minus alpha. But your second is going to be alpha times alpha minus 1 by k to the alpha minus 2. Now that alpha minus 1, because alpha is less than 1, that's going to be negative. Okay? That's what's going on up here. So that's why they, they want the particular term to be done. And I do the DC uh, expression as well. I, I've now got dk dt and dc dt down here. These are the original differential equations. So I've substituted in the production function into those original equations there. So there's k to the alpha turning up here and k to the alpha minus 1 turning up down here. What you've got when you try to get the solution, you have terms involving down here, k raised to a non-integer power, it's 0.3, and k raised to minus 0.7. So you can't do a simple quadratic for that. The fractional terms mean you've got to iteratively try to converge on what that value might be. Okay? Um, and that's where a huge part of the time process is involved as well. And when you try to work out the equilibrium, I've actually got that covered here, I've got to cover that verbally. When you try to work the equilibrium values, that involves the, the, the square the, 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 the square roots of the, of, the, of the partial fractional roots, and it's an impossible equation. It simply can't be solved. So again, think what they would have liked to reach versus what they did reach. They've got an insoluble, non-unstable equilibrium. And they cope with that by using numerical methods to estimate what it has to be, given all the parameter values. Backwards iterate that. It's a disaster. But they've done it step by step in such a way that it's incredibly complicated and challenging. And that's what they mainly focus upon. So if you take a look at the work they've done, it's an impressive amount of, unfortunately, in my opinion, and I think fairly easy to back, back up, useless work. Let's see if I can find... Um, this is a 244-page free book on how to solve a set of, a, a set of DSGE models. The one I most recommend taking a look at if you want to see where all this stuff comes from is the Asimoglu's lectures, which are very good. Um, taken from MIT, and he will go through the whole process of solving it. At various points, he, he lets various points of mathematics, he does them in the background and doesn't explain them properly, so it takes a while to derive, and that's why I, I would move across to Groth's work as well. Let's see if I can find Groth's book here as well. Uh, which one is that? It's the free book. Yeah, that's right. Another one. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend paying money for this, of course, but it's a good free book. And so I've got that. Is that it? No. Um, hang on. Find Roth over here. I think it's chapter 10 in the 2016 version. So it's extremely good work. Okay. It, a lot of intellect has gone into this. It's just unfortunately based on a, on a futile foundation with a lot of good work. But I'm not using hmm? techniques, optimal control theory. Hmm? Are they using optimal control theory? No, um, they, they've got, they're taking some elements from it. Yeah. But to actually use it properly, you need to have a system you can specify. So they've had to do a whole lot of other stuff to make their, their models. All the numerical stuff they do on top is... I mean, the computations involved in keeping an oil rig floating in the North Sea are far less complicated than are needed for a DSG model. The former works, the latter doesn't. And it's, it's, but there are ideas that have stolen from all over the, over the mathematical world to try to make this work. But it's an enormous amount of work to get even the first starting of a model. Whereas I showed you a good one. I start from two definitions. You know, about 10 minutes of basic calculus later, I've got a model that is actually empirically well developed now well-founded. We, there was a paper I was unfortunately involved in being the referee on, which had a table of numbers showing how good models didn't work. 
and I was unhappy about it, but it looked like it was well done econometrics, so I approved the paper. And then about five years later, I decided to use the parameters from that to fit my model, and I graphed the Phillips curve, and it was just off the scale. It was ridiculous. So I wrote to the author, David Harvey, who's a good bloke, and said, David, I tried to fit your model to the data, but it's, it's Phillips curve looks weird. And he wrote back to I'm terribly sorry, Steve. I made a simple schoolboy error. I calculated the um, model in terms of percentages and didn't convert back to fractions. So all these numbers are out by a factor of 100. And when you corrected for that, rather than the Goodwin equilibrium being outside all the OECD cycles that he found, it was inside all of them. But it's stuck in the literature, so people think the Goodwin model doesn't work. In fact, it does, and my good friend and colleague, Matthias Graciali, oh, Graciali's done the work to show that empirical work again, showing the Goodwin model works. So you can fit it to the data. It gives you the general characteristics of the system. It's derivable from definitions. These guys doesn't fit the data, and they've got to work so hard. They, this is why the one thing I, I couldn't understand initially when I was looking at the stuff is where why, why phase diagrams? Why not have... Um, if, well, the thing is, all they can do is qualitative diagrams. This is the phase diagram they do for the stability of the uh, equilibrium, and they've got a. This is the where this is where the rate of change of the capital labour ratio is zero, and this is where the rate of change of consumption is zero. There's your equilibrium point, and they're working out what happens in this point, what happens here, all this moving aside. It's all done visual in, in drawings because they can't actually get to the stage the sort of calculations I showed you for good one. So they're strange, you know, why are they doing, why diagrammatic, why aren't they, oh, that's why they can't actually solve it. So, hmm. so I, I hope to give you more detail. What I actually hope to show you how to derive a DSG model. And then I realised initially that, that that buries you in accepting each of the steps they're doing on the way. When I have more time, maybe for next year, then I'll actually fill that in and give the steps involved in getting from the idea of utility maximising agents to the idea of the Euler equation they get for that and from their equation for firms' output to a Phillips curve, the new Keynesian Phillips curve, and pull it all together. But it ends up being an incredibly simple set of equations which are incredibly hard to calculate because they make incredibly ridiculous assumptions about the future determining the present. And not only that, us knowing the future that's going to determine the present.